Uncaged, the story of the 2006 American League champion Detroit Tigers, is brought to you by Meyer. It's a clear, cool night in downtown Detroit. We play in a baseball city, you know, Detroit. Yeah. And the fans waiting for this for how many? 20 some years? 22. 22 years. The World Series has returned to Detroit for the first time since 1984. We're two and a half hours before the game, and this place is packed. There is a buzz in this city. It is a packed ballpark tonight. Let's go, Tigers! Woo! That's what I'm talking about. And they can't wait for the first pitch of game one of the World Series with the Cardinals. I've had dreams about being in the World Series. Being in the World Series. Being in the World Series. Tigers come in on a tremendous roll. Seven straight in the postseason, three against the Yankees, four against the Oakland A's. Oh, man! Three-run, walk-off, home run! Well, nobody picked us to beat the Yankees. Nobody picked us to beat Oakland. The Tigers are going to the World Series! The Tigers are going to the World Series! What a turnaround. Everybody remembers the last weekend. Lost five straight, all at home. But suddenly, Jim, the turnaround of the postseason has just been tremendous. The way we were underdogs and the way we just played our hearts out and, and left everything out on the field all year long, that's what our team symbolizes. It's fantastic. We have the greatest fans in the world. This whole area is alive with the Tigers, and uh, it's Tigers, Tigers, Tigers. This city is built on work and work ethic, and that's what makes this team, the 2006 team, so much like the 68 team. They playing ball like Willie Horton and Al Keyline. Got their heart and soul right on the line. The day has finally come for Detroit. Very special thing with this ball club this year after so many, so many difficult seasons. 12 straight losing seasons and now this. It's such a miracle team. And one of the greatest turnarounds in baseball history. It's kind of like a movie just building up to a certain point to a climax. Just three years after losing 119 games, the Detroit Tigers have reached the World Series against really all odds. To see that ballpark filled up, what a beautiful ballpark and have that many people in there cheering you on. We can't wait for game one to get started and we're just moments away. We kind of took on this aura of, all right, you don't believe us, but watch us play. Watch us beat your brains out every night. Major League Baseball Productions presents Uncaged, the story of the 2006 American League champion, Detroit Tigers. Being a part of the 2006 World Series, just three years after setting an American League record for futility, was a concept even the most diehard Tigers fans found difficult to grasp. I never dreamed they could make it to the World Series, let alone win as many games as they did. It was amazing. They've backed us in our downtimes in 203 when we went through a tough season. Tigers have lost 100 for the second straight here. You know, it seems like every single night. I would come to the ballpark and say, well, how are we going to lose today? 2003 was one of those years where no matter what you did, no matter how hard you tried, you just were not going to come out on top. The Tigers have now lost 10 straight and 118 for the season. Everything you listened to that year was negative on how bad the Tigers were. They'll never be any good. What a tough, tough year it was for the entire Tigers organization. But these Tigers were about to show signs of life. You go back to the end of that 2003 season and going into that off season and you think, how are they possibly going to get this team better for next year. The architect of this team. The architect of this team. The architect of this team. Dave DeBrosses sort of putting all the pieces together. It's like putting a puzzle. Here, after about a month of no comments. No comments. No comments. It's nice to be able to make this announcement. What free agent in their right mind would want to sign here? I am happy to introduce to you 
Yvonne Pudge Rodriguez. Pudge Rodriguez. Pudge. It's incredible because in Detroit, for so long, we've had so many major free agents say no. They don't want to play. And you get all of a sudden a very different feel going into the year. You knew it had to be better than the year before. Let's go, Bob. With the addition of Pudge Rodriguez and because we've got nowhere to go but up after last year. Keep it down, Bobby. Keep it down. Don't play right now. Come on out. I'm just going to look forward to, uh, to do my best. And Rodriguez has himself a double. We're going to see this Detroit Tiger team in the playoff region. And the Tigers are on the board and not dead yet. 28 win improvement was pretty impressive. This crowd at Comerica Park on its feet. And that really began it. Suddenly, free agents are looking at this franchise because of people like Pudge being here. And if you think about it, you're the start of the renaissance because oh, if you yeah. don't sign here, Mags doesn't sign here. The newest Detroit Tiger, Maglio Ordonez. Maglio Ordonez. Maglio Ordonez. The next year to add Maglio Ordonez, and then you see the development of the young arms. And they just hung in there with the Robertsons and the Bondermans and the Maroths. They told me when I signed here that Mr. Ailey's told me that he's going to put a winning team together, you know? To see the Dave Dombrowski era take fold, he made the best trades ever made. You know, the Polanco trade, the uh, Guillen trade. Come on, baby. You know, when I came here my first year, I got a, a feeling we're going to do better. Kind of got a picture that there's a nucleus here that if you can put some other folks there that are good players, you know, we could turn this thing around. He told me straight out, you know, he's going to take a few years. So he promised me he's going to put a winning team together. And by 2006, Dombrowski had done precisely that. Had a Kenny Rogers and a Todd Jones in the bullpen, then you've got a Granderson, a Verlander, and a Zumaya. And it's the kind of things that have to come together if you're going to have a championship caliber team. The puzzle was almost complete. And then the final piece was Jim Leland. It took me a long time to get here. I signed with the Tigers in 1963. He was very thoughtful about handling the whole tram versus me. The Tigers are moving forward. The Tigers are moving forward. I think we all have our respect, but somebody was going to manage this team. And I'm glad it's me. And he wanted to make sure that he didn't in any way denigrate what Alan Trammell had done. He's an icon in Detroit, a guy that played his whole career there, great man. Even though he's not with us as our manager, you know, he got us to where we are. I learned so much from him, because here's a guy that believed in me, gave me the opportunity to do some of the things that I'm doing right now. The foundation was dug and built, and, and a large part of the house was built by that previous coaching staff. But Jim Leland was a different person. I gotta tell you, this is the first Tiger hat that I have that did not have those things in the back that was adjustable from the minor. <laughs> Sometimes, in some ways, as Dombrowski has said, it's a witch's brew of, of personalities and, and growth by the players. And you bring in a few other players who change the dynamic of a team, and the tone is set from the top, and that's Leland. You know, it's the manager. I can assure you we will be a team. I loved his line at the press conference. I treat every single player the same, I treat everybody the same. But I treat every single player different. But I treat everybody different. And that's the way it'll be. Meaning you have to play under these certain rules that I have. He doesn't have many rules. I never talk about winning to my team. But I also understand it's 25 individuals, and I have to reach each guy a different way, maybe. I never say, we got to win this game, or I never ask my team to win. For whatever reason, that personality of Jim Leland fit with this team. But I demand that my team prepare to win. I won't tolerate anything less. And so, 2006 was the dawn of a new era in Detroit. And with it came a whole new approach to the game. Right now, this is just for now. The main thing was Leland. Leland came in, spring training, and said, hey, we're not going to fool around. We're not going to mess around here. I like to play nine innings, and I like to play nine innings hard. He talked about playing nine innings and never quitting and walking around with confidence and cockiness, so to speak. He said, look at the Yankees, how they walk under the field. They know they're good. Right now, you guys don't look like you think you can win. By the end of spring training, they started to really gel, got off to a great start on the road. The Tigers are 4-0 and for the season. 
I guess the start of the season, you know, nobody thought we were going to do anything. It's been great so far. I mean, we, we, you know, we've off to a good start. When they started out as hot as they did, you thought that they had to cool off, which they did. The White Sox sweep the three-game series. When they ran into the White Sox early in the beginning, was the, okay, reality setting in. And it was all too real for long-suffering Detroit fans. So following a lackluster homestand, Leland unleashed a post-game tirade that brought his players back on track. Leland came in and uh, closed all the doors up and started letting us have it. It's my responsibility to have the team ready to play today. They weren't ready to play. They were ready to get on the plane and go to Oakland. If we won, it was okay, and if we lost, it was okay, and that's not good enough. And pretty much the main point was we're not going to settle for coming out and performing and getting beat, knowing that we could have performed a lot better than that. We stunk, period, stunk. It's been going on here before, and it's not going to happen here. Are there any other questions? If not, I'm done. I think that was one of the best things that had ever happened to us. From that point on, we focused for nine hard innings exactly the way he said it, and that's what turned it all around for us. Chris Shelton has gone deep. Number 10 for Shelton. That baseball to him that month must have looked like a beach ball. He is some kind of locked in right now. It's ridiculous what he's been able to do. And while Shelton was tying team records, the Tigers were reaching uncharted new heights. And the Tigers, for the time being, are tied for first in the Central. These boys are starting to feel it. Everybody's starting to look around. It's like, what's going on? We're winning all these games, so, so we must be pretty good. Tigers win. They bad, Mario, with a capital B. Eight straight wins for the Tigers. They are rolling. And everyone in their highly competitive division was taking notice. Detroit, not surprised me at all. They're hungry, uh, and they're coming, and they're coming real hard. The Tigers win! Hit to second base, Polanco, Guillen, and the Tigers sweep the Cardinals. Everybody keeps on saying Detroit's a fluke, and I, I said at the beginning of the year, if they stay healthy, they're going to be right there towards the end. Boy, these guys are playing some outstanding baseball right now. Having this turnaround, going from terrible to now the best in the league, is tremendous. The fans are turning out. Well, the Tigers are indeed restoring the roar here at Comerica Park. And another big crowd here at the ballpark, better than 31,000 fans. Detroit is, especially in baseball, you know, it's been such a long time. It just gave people something to come back to. A lot of the fans had sat through some terrible seasons in the years past, and this was a year that once we got about a month, two months into the season, we knew that we could do something special for the city of Detroit. And the Tigers, 80 games into the season, are 30 games over the 500 mark. If somebody said, what's the one thing that has made a difference so far, I would have to say the pitching staff. Leland did a great job taking all this talent, old, young. Bringing Rodgers in was fantastic for all of the younger players. It's hard to get here, but it's harder to stay. And that's something that he showed me right from the get-go, is, is how hard he worked and why he's been here for so long. The veteran Rogers was the perfect mentor for youngsters like Justin Verlander, Joel Zamaya, and the improved Mike Maroth. Swing and a miss, down he goes. Hey, Mike Maroth has done a nice job with his fourth strikeout. In the beginning part of the season in 06, he did tremendous for us. They had great pitching. Maroth made pitches when he needed to. But in May, Maroth's season would come to a painful end. And that's going to do it for Mike Maroth. To lose him at that point of the season, it, it was kind of emotionally draining for a lot of the guys because they know that he deserves a good season after losing 20 games in 2003. Welcome back to Comerica Park in downtown Detroit. The Tigers are loose, they are ready, and so are we for the second half of the season. The Tigers make it 70 wins in their first 103 games. All good teams, though, they go through slumps during the season. And unfortunately for us, it was in the second half and it was late in the season. Strike three called, and the White Sox sweep the Tigers. Detroit has lost the season high five in a row. You got sucked in to the point where you were so excited about them winning when they started to go on that losing streak. It was almost a little bit of denial. 
you didn't want to think that, boy, they could blow this lead. Tigers' lead is down to five and a half games. It was ten just a few days ago. Adding injury to insult, the Tigers' spark plug, Placido Polanco, badly injured his shoulder while making a game-saving catch against Boston. Polanco hurt his shoulder, but held onto the ball and kept the lead. Tremendous play. And though Detroit won that game, the Tigers would be seven games under 500 with Polanco out of the lineup. Then it came September, and, you know, guys were kind of doubting themselves a little bit. The Twins take three out of four and are just two games out of first place in the American League Central. The Tigers now lead the Minnesota Twins by just one game in the American League Central. In mid-September, when it got a little hairy, you just stay with Jim, and Jim will walk you right through it. I'm not going to put any pressure on anybody to say, you know, we got a great chance to get in the playoffs. I mean, if that happens, fine, but you got to earn that. So we'll see if we earn it. And earn it, they did. The Detroit Tigers are back on the baseball map. They are in the playoffs. It was a sense of accomplishment like I can't even describe to you. Finally, we get to repay the fans of Detroit and give them something to cheer for. It has been 19 years since the Tigers have made the postseason, and the day has finally come for Detroit. I'm so excited for the city of Detroit, you know, because you, you know, we tried so hard, and, uh, it, and we did it. Hello again, everyone. The playoff bound Detroit Tigers are back home. Where they would try to win their first division title in 19 years. To win the division, you know, outright at the end of the season, that, that would have been great. But you know what? We got beat. And the Minnesota Twins will win the Central Division as the Royals come into Detroit and sweep the Tigers. To stay in first place right up to the last day of the season and then lose it, yeah, I, I thought that was going to be their downfall. And so the Tigers will enter the playoffs as the wild card, and they will take on the New York Yankees in the first round of the playoffs. It was one of those situations where you're crushed, but at the same time, you realize there still is light at the end of the tunnel. Well, it's already done. It's finished. Get on your plane, go to New York, and get busy. The feel-good story of the year, the Detroit Tigers stumbled down the stretch. They lost their last five games. They are the wild card. We've done a great job of playing on the road, playing at any ballpark, and we just look forward to it as another challenge. And we know who the Yankees are. We have the most respect for them. We got a good team, and we're trying to battle them. We're trying to make this real interesting. We know we're an underdog. Jim Leland was saying before the game, you know, we're going to be aggressive. Everybody feels that we've backed into this. We didn't back into anything, and I'm really proud of my team. We won 95 games. But despite that impressive total, Few expected the Tigers to get past one of the most imposing lineups ever assembled. And that won't go! Derek Jeter with a home run, he's five for five. And the Yankees take an 8-4 lead. Ninth inning, one on, one out, and a 1-1 one -one pitch. Round ball to second, could end the game. Cano to Jeter, one on the first, double play, there it is. And game one here in the Bronx goes to the Yankees. And being behind right now, nobody's definitely hanging their heads and we know it's not over. The Tigers may have been the only ones in all of baseball who felt that way. But following a disputed rainout of game two, the team quietly began to purr behind their rookie pitcher. Verlander actually was clocked at 100 or more 19 times this year. You know, my game plan was not to be scared. Go out there, be aggressive, challenge them, and you know, kind of put their backs against the wall. You send a rookie out there, you know he's going to be wound up. You know he's going to be into the game. Now that is nasty. You know, I was living pretty dangerously the whole game. You know, I kept having guys on base and was able to get out of it. Base is loaded. The curveball, strike three call. He just shut him down. Johnny Damon hits a home run. A three-run Damon Dinger, and the Yankees take a three-one lead. He wipes it off like no big deal. Curveball struck him out. He was determined to beat the Yankees on that particular day. And that determination rubbed off on everyone else. Carlos Guillen into the 
a home run porch at Yankee Stadium, and we start over again. It is three to three. We know we could turn around in one pitch, one at bat, one game. That's yeah. left center field. That's into the gap. Marcus Timms will score the go-ahead run. A triple for Curtis Granderson, and the Tigers have gone ahead four to three. Leland had used his bullpen masterfully all year long, and now he called on Jamie Walker. That's a big man to keep off the bases yes. late in the game. And I knew they weren't going to let him pitch the cheater. They're bringing Zumaya in. Here I am over here, a little pop gun. He sounds like an AK-47 beside me, and I'm going, what in the world's wrong with me? Well, we had the heat with Verlander, and now the heat is going to be turned up even more. Joel had gained quite a reputation during the season thanks to his triple-digit fastball. A swing and a miss. Die is out and so on the Chicago White Sox. I think part of Joel's mindset is I think he likes those five, six at-bats uh, when the game's on the line. Swing and a miss. He got him with a breaking ball. And a fist pump for Joel Zamaya. To see a guy stay at 99 to 101, 102 is an unbelievable sight. I'm one of those guys that will know where every radar gun is in the stadium, and if not, I will find it. It's just what I feed on. I know if I threw it by you at 101, I know I can do it again, and I'll try to do it harder. Do they flash the 103 up there for I don't know. He has such a tremendous arm that it's, it's nearly impossible to hit. Joel's regular season numbers were outstanding, and in game two of the division series, he continued to excel. Said 103. I didn't know that radar gun went up that high. Hey, he struck out swing with a fastball. You know, for him to come in and strike out three guys, it was just like that sense of, oh, we've got this wrapped up now. Indeed, they did, thanks to Todd Jones. The final element in the bullpen, once again, used to perfection. And a high pop up, shallow center, Polanco. And now Granderson in. He throws him off. The Tigers have won it. The team that was already being sent home, and Jim Leland said, you know, they're depicting us as if we brought the junior varsity here. Well, this is a good ball club, and the Tigers proved it here today. To do what we did today with those kids and the way we played the game, I hope that everybody realizes that we are a playoff team, because I'm not sure everybody believed that. With the series now back in Detroit, confidence was running high. Go Tigers! The division series was tied at one game apiece, and now the Tigers had their fans. But it was the Yankees who seemed destined to win. For Detroit's starting pitcher was Kenny Rogers, who hadn't beaten New York in 13 years. What's more, the former Yankee had pitched in nine postseason games and was 0-3 with an ERA of almost nine. It didn't look good for Detroit. Look, I was there when he was in New York, and Kenny Rogers just, he failed. In my past performances in the playoffs, I haven't done that well, but I was not going to be intimidated. I was going to be out there in front of him competing as hard as I possibly could. And though Rodgers would have to beat Randy Johnson, the big unit proved to be no match. This is a different Kenny Rogers than what these Yankee hitters have seen before. Strike called. He stood there like the house by the side of the road. I would love to know what was going through his mind on the afternoon before he pitched. I knew before the game started I was going out there and physically it was going to take a toll on me. But I didn't care. I wanted to match their intensity or exceed it. Sean Casey knocked Johnson out of the game in the sixth and gave Rodgers even more than he would need. Ball went the wall. Punch scores. Casey to second. Fired to the Tigers. For me, this is my first pro season, so, you know, it's a different feeling. It's a different adrenaline. It's a different rush. The Tigers look to put it away in the seventh with who else? Curtis Granderson. In just his first full season in the major leagues, Granderson looked every bit like an up-and-coming star. And throughout 2006, he showcased his flair for the dramatic. Well, here's Granderson. Last chance for the Tigers. And well, Friel going back, still going back. And he is 
I knew that he was going to come through with the hit, and sure enough, right then, bam, he hits a home run. Do you believe it? I do now! He's been clutch all season for us. When I've been on base, every time late innings in a game, I always knew he was going to come through with the hit. Back up the middle, in the center field, a base hit. Here comes in. Baldelli spotted the play. is airmailed. He scores. And the Tigers win in the 13th inning. You're not going to get a situation to do it often, but when you can, you want to try to capitalize on it. I was able to get a chance to celebrate any way to help this team win, and that was one of the moments I had right then and there. No question, Granderson's all-around power game is one of the best in the American League. And now, with Game 3 of the Division Series slipping away from the Yankees, Curtis continued his power display in the playoffs. Fly ball! Right field! Goal! Curtis Granderson, what a postseason! 6 nothing Tigers in the seventh! Detroit was absolutely rocking, but Rodgers was dealing. The fans are chanting, can he, can he? Can he keep it up? Sure can. Swing and a miss! He takes this emotion out there with him, and he's fist pumping, and he's, you know, his adrenaline's going. Fifth strikeout for Kenny Rogers. Kenny Rogers has lost seven straight games to the Yankees, but tonight, he's dazzling them. Swing and a miss! Got him again! Game three eight with Kenny Rogers pitching at home, and that place was phenomenal. Strike after strike. I after know he. Strike. Kenny Rogers from the get go stepped in, and he was similar to like a player coach. Just having him on this team, I, I think, brought all of us to a different level. Our whole staff, besides himself, is young. He kind of brought us along and, and showed us the way by his leadership. I talked to Bondo and Burr, just sometimes just pitch selection, just what you're thinking out there. The professor, that's what we're calling him. His fire, his passion for playing this game. Not only playing it, but wanting to be at the highest level, like to be the best. And it fires you up and it says, you know what? That's how I'm gonna play every inning, every pitch. That philosophy earned Rodgers a memorable milestone at Wrigley Field during interleague play on June 18th. Kenny Rogers win number 200 in his career. Congratulated by his teammate. Three weeks later, Kenny stood in the spotlight amidst the very best in the game. At age 41, he was the second oldest player ever to appear in an All-Star Game starting lineup. Go, baby. He pitched the first two innings on the way to a 3-2 win for the American League. Much like a fine wine, Kenny Rogers was getting better with age. And his vintage performance in the division series ended after seven and two-thirds innings of dominant shutout ball. And in the ninth, Todd Jones finished him off. Rocks into his motion, one-two pitch, swing and a miss! Tigers win! The Tigers have a two games to one lead over the Yankees. I was leaving it all out there, and effort-wise, I couldn't put more effort into the game than I did tonight. I was emotional out there, and I wanted this game as much as any game I've ever won in my life. One. That's how many wins stood between the Tigers and the championship series. In game three, it was Granderson who homered. In game four, Detroit's other two starting outfielders went deep, both in the second inning. The Tigers take a one nothing lead here in the bottom of the second. Two batters later, Craig Monroe realized a moment that had only lived in his imagination. I've had dreams about being in the postseason, and it's funny that I'm in it this year. And for some reason, I, I saw myself having success. I'm sitting here thinking, make hard, solid contact on the barrel of the bat, and good things will happen. It's deep to left field. Cabrera at the wall, looking up. It's gone! Shot for Craig Monroe. Tigers lead it 3 0 here in the second. And as good as the Detroit offense was, pitcher Jeremy Bonderman was better, especially through five. 15 up, 15 down. 
four by strikeout. But again, this was no surprise. You see, in 2006, Jeremy continued to fulfill his promise as one of the game's great young pitchers. Jim Leland said it's time to graduate, young man, and boy, has he done that. Jeremy's just becoming a more well-rounded pitcher. Swing and a miss, down goes Pujols. A 95-mile-an-hour fastball from Bonneville. He's just learned things through experience, what he can do and what, what he needs to do, and, and I think it's just been a natural process and one that's still ongoing. You knew he's going to be able to strike out a lot of people. Everyone already knows he has one of the best sliders in the game. Slider, strike three. Bonnerman did an unbelievable job this year on spotting his fastball. Fastball, 95 miles an hour. When people thought a slider was coming, which is his best pitch, well, he snuck a fastball in there, and it put something in the back of their mind that said, well, this kid is learning how to pitch now. He even had back-to-back -back 12 strikeout games. He struck out seven of the last eight batters that he's faced. Bonnerman with that electric slider, he's mixing in that fastball, but a lot of sliders second third time through and he did something no Detroit pitcher had accomplished in 19 years all oh, strike three Rios knew it 200 strikeout this year the last Tiger to strike out 200 Jack Morris in 1987 coincidentally the last time the Tigers went to the playoffs now Bonderman was a big reason why the Tigers were back in the playoffs Jeremy finished with 202 Ks, second only to Johan Santana. Bonderman left game four of the ALDS with one out in the ninth after giving up just two runs. Moments later, the Tigers officially did what few thought was possible, sending the vaunted New York Yankees packing. Polanco to Casey. Dropping game one in the best of five, they sweep the best team in the American League three straight. And a 95 win team that, in the eyes of many, was a complete underdog to a 97 win team. In the words of Jim Leland, some thought it was the freshman playing the varsity. <laughs> well, they may win one game, they're lucky to be in it. This was the junior varsity against the varsity, you know. And it wasn't the junior varsity against the varsity after uh, the Tigers got through with the Yankees. The whole team has come out now. They celebrate it inside. A lot of them are coming back outside now. They want to share it with this city. Take a look at this. A tribute to our fans, baby. This is great. They're going all over the place, down the left field line, over towards the visiting dugout, down the right field line. This is remarkable. It's a guy who's been criticized for not being personable and not winning big ball games. How's he looking now? <laughs> you want to spend the night in jail, Kenny? The Tigers have defeated the New York Yankees in the best of five, three games to one. Detroit against Oakland is your LCS in the American League. The Tigers had shocked all of baseball by eliminating the Yankees. Now they sought to win the pennant. They are revved up on a beautiful baseball night in Oakland, California. The sellout crowd at McAfee Coliseum for game one of this American League Championship Series. There was a reflection of uh, what we just did, and, and then we just had to come back and listen to how, you know, or what went wrong with the Yankees instead of what went right with the Tigers. Not many when this season began figured either one of these teams would be here. Therefore, Cinderella has officially arrived in the ALCS. Game one stayed scoreless until the third when Brandon Inge, the number nine hitter, reminded folks just how deep the Tigers lineup was all year long. This one with the sack jam. You can hit it. No, I can't. I just get lucky every once in a while. My mindset in baseball is you do whatever you can to win a ball game and whatever you can to help out your teammates. Diving stop in. Here's the throw. He's out. Oh, what a play by Brandon. I just like to go out and have fun, keep it simple, and just play the game hard. Ground ball, deep third, backhanded by Inns. Turns, throws, got him. He has literally been a human highlight film. 
to get some exercise, I told you. Inge brought both consistency and power to the plate. And now, he waited on Barry Zito's pitch in game one of the LCS. I went out there with the game plan of, I'm going to hit a changeup out over the plate. Next thing I know, he throws me a fastball up and in. Fly ball down the left field line. It is hooking, it is deep, and it is gone! And the Tigers draw first blood of the ALCS. They lead Oakland 1-0. But that was only the beginning. Fly ball deep center field. Going back is Katze, and he will watch it go out of here. But Rodriguez touch the ball over the 388 mark. Tigers lead three to nothing. It was still another memorable moment for Pudge, the foundation of Detroit's regular season success. High fly ball. Did he do it? It's gone. It's a walk off home run for Pudge. Go ahead on the Pudgy one. He knows how to play the game. He plays hard. Mark, 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 Mark. So young guys see him playing hard, and the guy that's been around for so long, so encouraged them to play hard. Diving catch by Pudge Rodriguez. I'm doing my best every day. I'm a hard worker. I play the game hard. And the best thing is that I'm healthy. I'm, I feel great at the field. Pudge will come down to second. He is out of second base. Oh, my goodness. How committed was Yvonne? Consider that when Polanco went down with his injury, the 12-time gold glover put on a brand new glove. Pudge Rodriguez takes over at second base for the first time in his career. When I saw Pudge do what he did by volunteering, saying he would go to second base, it was a feeling of, all right, this is why I like this guy, because I know he's going to do whatever it takes to win a ball game. On the 2006 Tigers, Pudge was looked upon for leadership. And his game one LCS blast set the stage for more. There's a base hit up the middle. That base hit brings Brandon Inge home from third, and they lead five to nothing. Nate Robertson nurtured that five-run lead, but ran into trouble in the fourth when Oakland came a hit away from making it a game. But Nate rose to the challenge, much like he had in the course of the year. Nate's always been a bulldog. Swing and a miss. Robertson carved him up, no problem. His attitude on the field is, no one's going to hit me. No one's going to beat me. I'm going to do whatever I can to win the ball game. Swing and a miss. He stuck it out. Nate Robertson has come back nicely with two punch outs. 2006 was Robertson's best year in the major leagues. And he continued to shine in game one of the LCS. Nate Robertson trying to get himself off the hook. Two down. Here's the pitch. Paul strike three. He struck out the side after a walk and a double. I've never backed down from a situation like that. If they beat me, they beat me with my best stuff. And so I came right at him. Once again, it was up to Todd Jones to bring it home. Ordonez reaches up, one hands it, and the ball game is over. The Detroit Tigers beat the Athletics 5-1. Now the A's had to face Verlander in game two. And during the 2006 season, Justin had displayed Rookie of the Year credentials. Justin Verlander has hurled a two-hit shutout. Justin Verlander, oh, man. To tell you the truth, I don't know where that 100 comes out of him. Well, Joel might not know, but this cat does. I get my big guns from Kit Kats, which is not that big of a stretch. He has such electricity in that right arm. Justin is going to be a number one, number two starter for the rest of his career. He's uh, fun to watch. Verlander's going to get his share of strikeouts. This guy's got amazing stuff. He has that ability to reach back when he needs to get a little more. He can go upstairs and blow guys away with 99 to 100 miles an hour. That was 101 miles an hour. He's brought an attitude that he expects to do well. He didn't expect to come up here and just be happy to be in the major leagues. Swing and a miss. Got him on strikes. When you have a young guy that's talented and has that kind of mindset, then uh, some good things can happen. Even flying as high as Detroit's favorite bird. And Justin's electric stuff continued in game two of the LCS. Breaking ball back door, ring him up, strike three called, and Swisher knew it. Here's a one-two. What a breaking ball by Verlander. I actually felt pretty calm and collected. I thought I'd be a little uh, too pumped up, a little too excited, and have to kind of idle myself down, but I felt all right. With Verlander keeping the game close, the Tigers went to work. Fly drive back to the middle for a base hit. That will score Polanco. They will hold Maglio at third. Tigers trail now three to two. 
Up came Alexis Gomez, making the most of his first ever postseason appearance. That ball hammered by Gomez in a deep right center field, and the magic touch indeed continues for Jim Leland. Well, I just thought that, um, you know, it might be a decent matchup. Uh, he's got big time power. And it is seven to three Tigers here in the sixth inning. And uh, he came through pretty big. Gomez in a lineup has knocked in four runs tonight. Leland continued to make moves in the sixth. And in the eighth, he called on Fernando Rodney, fresh off a solid 2006 season. Here is Fernando Rodney. Well, we know what Rodney can do. He's got a mid-90s fastball to go with a changeup that's, quite frankly, one of the best in all of baseball. Well, right now, I think he's surely one of the top setup guys in the game. He's done a great job for us. Strike three call. Throws it. He's been a big plus out in our bullpen. He's handled pressure. He's handled the situations well. He's handled everything, and I think he really enjoys it. Strike three call. Fernando Rodney strikes out the side. Rodney rarely gave up hits in 2006. And though Oakland closed to within two, Rodney kept the A's at bay. One two pitch, swing and a miss. He strikes out the side. Tremendous job by Fernando Rodney. We took a look at their bullpen. Uh, they got power arms out there. Once you fall behind against their club with their arms, it, it makes it tough. On to the ninth, where Jones tried to avoid some really big trouble. Frank Thomas is the winning run with the sacks juiced here in the bottom of the ninth inning. We're obviously very nervous about Frank Thomas at all times. There's a dramatic grand slam that goes through your mind when you're sitting there. Fortunately, it remained just a thought. High fly ball, Granderson charging hard, and the Tigers nail it down. And they've come to Oakland in this league championship series and won the first two games on enemy turf. It's exciting for us to be able to come here and, and get a couple games, but the work is not done. We won two games. The reality of it is that we play on Friday night in Detroit, and it'll be a whole new chapter because the playoffs are a whole new chapter each and every game. Here we go on a gray, cold day in Detroit. Friday the 13th can be an ominous day for some, but it didn't phase the Tigers, for they had a two games to none lead in the ALCS, and their ace on the mound. 41-year-old left-hander Kenny Rogers, Rodgers had shut down the Yankees in round one. Question was, could he do it again? That took a lot out of Kenny, you know, with his age and so forth. Every player has doubts about what they're capable of at certain given times, and I'm no different. But it's nice to know that if you're out there, you always have a chance to succeed. It's swing and a miss. Rodgers has retired eight in a row. Even if I'm limited in physical ability now, I know that I'm smarter and have more experience than I ever had. Swing and a miss. He got him on strikes. It's called the art of pitching. What a sensational outing again tonight. When he's right, he doesn't throw a lot of strikes. Makes you hit pitches you think are going to be strikes. There's a roller down to third. Tie double play. Kenny got some first inning support from the eventual series MVP. Lossy Dill pulled off the day. He's been a monster during this entire postseason. Fact is, Polly's been the go-to guy all year long. Polanco is one of the best all-around teammates. That, like, kind of fireball-y mentality that he has that he kind of sets a tone for this entire team. He's determined to get every hit and make every play. Unfortunately, that effort would cost him five weeks. But out goes Polanco to make a spectacular catch, and he injures his shoulder in the process. With Polanco on the bench, the Tigers missed their spark, and it showed up in the day-to-day -day results. But now he was back in game three of the LCS. Here's a line drive into right center. That's going to drop for a base hit. Three batters in, and the Tigers have a 1-0 lead. His performance in the ALCS was just, it speaks for itself. It's amazing what Polanco has done against the A's. With a 3-0 lead in the ninth, the Tigers turned to their venerable closer. And Todd Jones trying to nail it down in the bottom of the ninth. This was Todd's second time in Detroit. In fact, it was Jones who closed down Tiger Stadium. And Tiger Stadium is no more. 
Now he plied his craft at Comerica Park. One crafty closer. Jonesy with the save. That's a tiger sweep. But beyond Todd's pitching prowess, he's also been a teacher. The only reason I feel that I'm here and I'm being so successful is because of Todd Jones. Todd Jones spent every day in spring training letting me know the inside scoop of the bullpen, what I need to do, what my mentality needs to be. He helps out guys in the bullpen a lot. Well, I've been working real hard for this. Yeah. <laughs> and what better guy to do it than a guy who's got a lot of years of experience and a lot of experience closing out ball games. And that adds up to a lot of saves. 155 save for Todd Jones. And that makes him the franchise leader. Todd finished the 2006 season with 37 saves. So it was no surprise when he dusted off game three of the LCS. Santiago Fields from behind second throws the first and the Tigers have a three games to none lead over the Oakland A's. Detroit was on a roll. Six straight wins. One more to reach the World Series. But with their backs to the wall, the Oakland A's weren't about to go quietly. And Oakland has a 3-0 lead. But the Tigers clawed back, and the fur began to fly. And is gone! And the Tigers have tied it! That one left a vapor trail off the bat of Maglio Ordonez. For Maglio, 2006 was a season to savor. In 2001, 2002, I was always catching against Maglio Ordonez in their place, and I got so sick of seeing every ball that was supposed to come into my mitt leave and go into the stands. Maglio Ordonez hits it out. Mag's one of those guys that, for those years in Chicago, too, he's one of the best players in baseball that maybe never got the recognition. When we signed Maglio over here, I was so pleased to not be on the receiving end of his home runs. Maglio Ordonez, his fourth RBI. In Mags, Detroit had an all-star, and he was also clutch, the perfect man to have up with the clincher on the line. Game four of the league championship series was deadlocked. He's three and the Tigers three in the bottom of the ninth in Detroit. Oakland closer Houston Street got the first two Tigers out. The bottom of the ninth base is empty two outs. You're thinking, well, extra innings, here we go. But Craig Monroe had a different plan. Monroe, line drive, base hit, center field. And as you'd expect, Polly kept it going. Here's Polanco. The swing, the drive in the right center field. That's going to be in there, base hit. Back to back singles with two outs in the bottom of the ninth. Here's the cleanup hitter, Maglio Ordonez, to try and knock in the winning run. And I'm picturing, okay, Maglio's so good in these situations just to find that hole with a base hit. I was actually joking around with the guys around me saying, Craig Monroe is going to have to be able to run fast. He's at second base. I was assuming it was going to be a ball hit somewhere in the gap, and he's got to score. He's got to run fast. The potential series winning run in scoring position. I was at second base, and I got a chance to, to sit back and see the big pitcher. Inside, ball one. To see him take a pitch, good slider that he took, I knew he was seeing the ball well. And I said, man, there couldn't be a better guy up here right now because Mag looks like he's locked in. And so was the city of Detroit, hoping, praying. Then came the pitch. Swinging a fly ball, wow. left field, it's wow. deep. It's way back. The Tigers are going to the World Series. Three run, walked off, home run. You could feel the press box shake. In this brand new ballpark, you could feel it shake. And the Tigers have won the pennant. How more dramatic can you get? <laughs> We've seen it all year. Why not finish it that way? And they did. I want to be the first one out there to touch Maglio. I actually saw a picture of myself kind of boxing people out. What a sight at home plate. Just to watch the players jumping up and down. And uh, the reaction of the crowd, I mean, nobody left for how long? What a great, great feeling. And the fans are absolutely loving it. To be able to celebrate on the field with all of our friends and family in that clubhouse, it was just, it was amazing. It was also time to pass the torch. I'd like to present the American League Championship Trophy to Jim Leland and Mike Illich. 
And among the champs, one tiger stood tall. Lasso Polanco, the MVP. It was Motor City Madness. The power, the spark plug, and the man who drove them to the finish line. Seven straight wins and the American League pennant. It felt like an eternity, but after 22 years, the World Series was back in Detroit. It's a clear, cool night in downtown Detroit. The World Series has returned. Go Tigers! Game one! World Series program! Comerica Park is full. Two and a half hours before the game, and this place is packed. And this city is buzzing. Go Tigers! Everybody was wearing the old English D in some form, shirts, jerseys, old, young, male, females. This was a first for almost all the Tigers. Almost. What do you think about the World Series? Just, you know, ho oh, hum. You've been it. You've done it, bro. It's pretty yeah. awesome, huh? Well, fun. Yeah. Hey, Joy, congrats, dude. Everyone that's been there, been in the postseason, or been in the World Series, it tells you, it, you know, it's a different feeling. It's a different adrenaline. It's a different rush. And I think until you experience it, you don't understand what they're saying. It's just thrilled to be here, buddy. It's been great having you with us. It's electric, isn't it? You got any, like, words of wisdom that you can pass on to the people? Hey, buddy. How you doing? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. It's awesome. You gotta enjoy it every single in, every single moment. Everything all right? Hey, you're in the World Series, man. Both of these franchises with tremendous World Series history. Some might say this is the rubber match. That's because this was the third time these teams had met, starting in 1934 when the Tigers possessed a powerful trio. The G-Men. Tigers had Greenberg, Geringer, and Goslin, and they were known as Detroit's G-Men. This was quite a threesome. But even with these future Hall of Famers in the lineup, the Tigers couldn't find a way to beat Dizzy Dean. Here's a pitch. A pass down to second with DeRozier takes. Bob at the face for the final out of the 1934 World Series. A shutout for the great Dizzy Dean. We had a better team than the, than the Cardinals, and. Uh, we never got the recognition for it because A won the World Series and they had a very colorful club. They were a good ball team, but I thought we were better. The Tigers met St. Louis again in 1968, where 31 game winner Denny McLean and Bob Gibson locked horns. During the World Series, we knew we had to face Bob Gibson, and uh, he, was, uh, yeah, he was just overpowering in the first game. He got it! Not unlike their embattled city in the throes of late 60s societal change, the Tigers fought back from a three to one deficit only to face Gibson again in game seven. The pictures were of, God, I hope we can do this, but it's Bob Gibson. Squaring off against Gibson was Mickey Lolich, pitching his third game of the series on just two days rest. Mayo asked him, if, uh, can you give us a few innings? And Mickey said, oh, yeah, I, I can give you a few innings. And of course, five innings go by. And he would say, Mickey, are you OK? And Mickey said, yeah, I can give you one or two more innings. And all of a sudden, you know, he's pitching nine innings. Lolich is matching Gibson pitch for pitch and inning by inning. Lolich pitched probably the game of his life. And he matched Gibson through the entire game. It stayed scoreless through six. But a cardinal mistake in the seventh opened the door for Detroit. We made a couple of mistakes here or there, and the teams that make the fewest amount of mistakes when you get in a series like that, usually the team that wins. And that team would be the Tigers. Detroit, the new world champion. Everybody on our ball club absolutely went crazy. It was a great time for us uh, to become world champions, but it really meant a lot more, I think, to the city of Detroit, who had, a year before uh, went through a riot. We had some tough times in our cities in 67 and parts of 68, and. I think about the fans. They all told me about how it gave them a chance to get their mind off some things. People talk about, did the Detroit Tigers in 68 save the city of Detroit? No, they didn't save the city of Detroit, but they certainly helped heal the city of Detroit at a time when it needed healing. And now, once again, the 2006 Tigers provided a lift, a reason to rejoice with each and every game. Teams come around every time that the city needs a uh, boost. And in Detroit, that was this year. Since it's a state and a city that's going through such a tough time economically with all the job layoffs, 
and for three hours a night, we gave people that were really struggling in their lives something to cheer about. I think it just lifts everybody. You know, everybody's in a good mood, and it gives everybody hope. Memories of the 1968 team were rekindled when Al Kaline and Willie Horton threw out the first pitch. Now we'd find out if the week off had dulled Detroit's edge. Baseball's not like football where you can take a week off, the injury's healed. Baseball is about timing. It's about rhythm. The rookie Verlander started game one and his teammates quickly scored in the first, erasing fears of a letdown. But they wouldn't score again until the ninth when, down seven to one, they kept fighting. To feel the ball come off my bat, and all of a sudden it was just like, do you know where you're at? This is a World Series. And you just hit a home run. But then, Monroe had been a hero for the Tigers all season long. Swung on and belted. Deep in the air to left. Brian Slay it all, baby boy. Gotta love it. There were times during the season that, uh, you know, people would say this is a big game, and then he would step up and get a big hit. Three run shot in the night for Craig Monroe. Here's the 2 2. Swinging a high fly ball. Deep into left field. Michaels is back to the wall. He wants to let everybody in the world know that he is one of the top guys in this team and in all of baseball, and he is. He's been trying his best to produce, and he's come up big. High fly ball, deep in the left, way back, it's gone. That's what I'm talking about. Go head on with your bad self, young man. No one on the Tigers went deep more than Monroe in 2006. And though his Game 1 World Series blast would be too little too late, it sure set the tone for Game 2. There's one guy that'll be ready to go tomorrow night. For me, you can't throw away at bats. Even if you're out of the game and you've got to continue to prove to your teammates, this is where you guys want to be, this is what you want to do, and you want to win games. For further inspiration prior to Game 2, the Tigers turned to a pair of Detroit legends. First up, George Sparky Anderson, who had the honor of throwing out the ceremonial first pitch. And joined by a member of the Boys and Girls Club of Detroit, Alan Trammell delivered the ball for the game's first pitch. No excuses from manager Jim Leland, but clearly the week off affected the Tigers, and we're looking for a very different performance in game two tonight. The Tigers are looking at the next three games being played in St. Louis, and so they really must win tonight, or this World Series could be over very quickly. And for such a huge game, Detroit was quite happy to have its newly crowned postseason ace on the mound. And Kenny Rogers, has been incredible. He's not going to let this opportunity this year get away from him. 15 innings, and he has yet to allow an earned run. From the outset, it was perfectly clear that Rodgers, once again, was locked in. One out, nobody on. Here's the pitch on the way. Fastball, straight free corner of the inside corner. Two on, two out, and a comeback to the Rodgers. The Cardinals' Jeff Weaver was looking to match Rodgers on the mound. But once again, Monroe had his own plan to jumpstart Detroit. I'm going to be aggressive. I'm looking first pitch fastball, and I'm going to let it go. And here's a fly ball left field, way back! Off the bat of Monroe! Go! Tigers take a 1-0 lead in the first. That was a pretty good shot. Kind of set a tone for us. He came back to the dugout pretty fired up. With two out, Maglio Ordonez then set the table for one of Detroit's top postseason performers. In into left center field, Wilson back on the run at the track over his head. And Ordonez, all the way from first, makes it 2 0. Perhaps the most feared Tiger was Carlos Guillen, who had been clutch for Detroit throughout the year. Fact is, 
Carlos is one of the best kept secrets in all of baseball. When he gets on a roll, he's one of the best hitters I've ever seen. Anytime is a clutch situation, I want him at the plate. That's high, it's in the air toward the left, and it is gone! It's over the wall for a game-winning walk-off home run! Nobody hears about this guy, but Carlos Guillen is the most underrated player. The 3-2 is hit in the air toward left field, deep, way back, it's gone! He's one of those guys, man, if you get a chance to watch him every day, you really appreciate Carlos Keane. You start to realize he's one of the best players in baseball, that kind of thing, you know? He's also one of the most powerful shortstops in the majors. And now, with one out in the fifth of game two, Guillen would deliver again. Now here's Guillen, a span, past two holes, down the right field line, headed for the right field corner. Guillen digging for second. The ball finally picked up in the corner by Encarnacion. Guillen heading for third, a triple. That was another big hit for us, just another big hit for Carlos Guillen and for us in the postseason. It was crucial for us with, with some missed opportunities to try and, you know, to get him in. Sean Casey was acquired from Pittsburgh at the trading deadline for moments just like this. Weaver ready from the stretch. He throws. Third ball, line drive, base hit to right field. Guillen comes in to score, and Sean Casey delivers in the clutch. The two-out base hit, 3 nothing Detroit. Rodgers remained masterful allowing just one man to get into scoring position, baffling the cards and amazing his teammates. What he's been able to do is, has been unbelievable. Waiting on the payoff pitch from Kenny Rogers. Swing and a miss. Got him on strikes. It's an honor to watch. You know, it's one of the best postseason performances ever. Now the 2-2 pitch. Swing and a miss. Got him on strikes. I know that he's given 100% of his soul to go out there and win for us. Kenny Rogers has one hit the Cardinals through six. Kenny extended his 2006 streak of consecutive postseason scoreless innings to 23. Fastball swung on and missed. He struck him out. Kenny Rogers seven shutout innings. And for guys tasted no postseason success to do it back-to-back -back weekends in two big games has uh, just been a really incredible thing to watch. That man is absolutely driven. He continues to be the master of the postseason. Rogers' work was done after eight scoreless innings, but the game was far from over. Two down, runners at the corners. The pitch to Jimmy Edmonds, a tying run. The runner goes, swinging a little fly ball down the left field line of a spare struggle. It is fair. In the score is rolling, and the tying run in scoring position. A base hit to the outfield could tie the game. Here's the pitch. High and tight, and it hit Preston Wilson. Rogers may have appeared to be calm on the bench when the Cardinals threatened, but deep inside, as nervous as anything. <laughs> Bases loaded, two out. The 1-0 pitch. Ground ball to short. This should do it. Santiago underhand flip for the force at second, and the Tigers have tied the series in a game apiece. Yeah! 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 The series tying victory was vintage Detroit. Great pitching, timely hitting, and a dash of drama. Unfortunately, the World Series never did come back to Detroit, for the Tigers' season ended just three games later. The Cardinals are the world champions for 2006. Three years ago, this franchise lost 119 games. You came here, you established a winning culture, you get to the World Series in your first season. How proud are you of what this team accomplished? Well, I'm very proud, and I just hope that people don't forget where this team came from last year. 71 wins last year to a World Series this year, and so I hope that these players get the credit that they deserve for the job they've done. In the aftermath of the Fall Classic, Detroit returned to life as usual. The loss still lingered, no question. But memories of a spectacular season inspired an overwhelming sense of optimism. Unfortunately, they didn't play like they had played all year in the World Series, so little disappointment in that, but just for the team to make it to the World Series was absolutely amazing. The fact that for years, you know, they were the Tigers. One loss away from having the worst record ever in baseball, three years later being in the World Series and being that close. It was amazing. 
They made it to the World Series. I mean, you gotta feel a little disappointed you came this close, but with that little disappointment, there's a lot of accomplishment. It was really amazing when you know that they could do something when 2003 they had worst record. It was very, very special. I still felt like we won. We were at the World Series. <laughs> the Yankees weren't there. <laughs> it was something that Detroit needs. I think it really did help the city. I mean, it got people down here. There was a buzz. You know, it was the thing to do on a Saturday night was to go to the Tiger game. I think it absolutely brought life to this city that it hasn't seen in a long time. We had the Super Bowl last year, and this is wonderful for the city because it kind of pulls you together. Everybody's down here together to hang out, watch the Tigers. Baseball is the great American distraction. Our city, all the automotive, the economic hard times and whatnot, to have the Tigers uh, step up and play the way that they did, it really was great for the whole city. I think it just lifts everybody to see a team that struggled for 12 years in a row with a losing record can turn it around and there's been some economic hardships in this area. It gives everybody hope. What a turnaround. We feel like without that failure, we wouldn't know how to accept or enjoy our success that we're having now. Because I think it built character, because we've, we've, we've been on the other end of the stick. I think it's one of the great sport turnarounds of all time, number one, not just baseball turnarounds. And I remember talking to these kids and saying, look, these are the greatest fans in the world. They'd say, come on, Jim. I said, guys. It won't happen with us. I said, you wait, you wait. You win, you play hard, blue collar town. They will be up, they will be here. Welcome back to Comerica Park. We have another big sellout crowd watching the Tigers. I guess the start of the season, you know, nobody thought we were gonna do anything. Tigers win. Eight straight wins. And then we kind of took on this aura of, watch us beat your brains out every night. Tigers with the best record in baseball. Tigers are the hottest team on the planet. And the Tigers win in the night! 3 2 pitch. Swing and a fly ball. Gone! What the home run for Carlos Guillen! 70 wins in their first 103 games. Are we excited about the 95 win? Yeah, that's what we that's what we talk about. We talk about the positive things that happen as a team. It has been 19 years since the Tigers have made the postseason, and the day has finally come for Detroit. Well, nobody picked us to beat the Yankees. Maybe nobody picked us to beat Oakland. The Tigers, three years after losing 119 games, are going to the World Series all the job layoffs and things like that. I think this team, teams come around every time that the city needs a boost. And in Detroit, that was this year. And, and for three hours a night, we gave people that were really struggling in their lives something to cheer about. I think the renaissance has started. The 2006 season was over, but it would never be forgotten. Well, it's certainly a dream dream season. They looked like a team of destiny. It was such an exciting game for them to win it with Maglio doing what he did. And they have a left hand. The Tigers march to the World Series. It was just a feeling like you can you can't even explain. be proud of them. They did almost everything right this year. Pitching was so strong and all, so many young pitchers came in and did the job. 99 of the gun, Joel Zamaya. They got it done with great pitching and that's a very young pitching staff. Seven strikeouts for Furlander and the rookie struck out the side. Nobody really expected them to produce like they did. It was a lot of fun just to be around and see. Tigers, I'm looking on level. Eight straight wins for the Tigers. 
They were just playing great. And the Tigers win in the night. Putting the roar back in Detroit. On the ground, second base. Listen to the roar. Tigers in four. It was exciting, absolutely exciting. Let the celebration begin in that Tigers clubhouse. I think they're going to take it all next year. You know, the best is yet to come, mark my words.